Hello everyone, welcome back. Now it's time to start our next presentation where we will hear from Yenli Soto Albrecht. And she is a third year MD PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, Perelman School of Medicine. She previously attended Princeton University and earned a degree in molecular biology where she completed an award-winning thesis on the in vivo immunopathogenesis of yellow fever. Her career goals are to leverage her experience and privilege as a physician scientist trainee to both target pathogens that threaten global underserved communities and increase multifaceted diversity in her career path. Yantley has been an outstanding mentor of mine and I am very happy to introduce her presentation today. So play, please welcome Yantley as she discusses the topic applying to and initiating the career of a physician scientist and talks about her experience being an MD-PhD trainee. And I also wanna remind everyone to please um, send us any questions you might have on the Q&A chat and I will answer those questions with Yenli during the Q&A session. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Yenli can go ahead and share hers. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. Okay, I just need to start. Fantastic. Thank you for that introduction, Alejandra. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I made my presentation about 25 minutes so that there's an equal amount of time for questions because I think that the most use that you'll get out of this is if you're able to ask the questions that are most pertinent to you, um, depending on where you are in the journey to applying to MD PhD programs or considering applying. I wanted to highlight a little bit about my journey. Um, so I, as Alejandra mentioned, I went to Princeton and before I started my undergrad experience, I spent a year in Serbia tutoring Roma children. I also spent one summer um, during my undergrad in Bosnia and Herzegovina working at a gender equality NGO. Um, so I did plenty of non-research things, but I also did a lot of research. Um, so here is a picture from my uh, study abroad experience in England where I did research full-time in a biochemistry lab. Um, here is a picture of me giving my printed and bound senior thesis to my parents as a 25th anniversary present, which I thought was funny. Um, but I was lucky to have to do a senior thesis, so there was some, some level of independence in my research experience kind of built in. And then I uh, decided to take two gap years, um, and here I am in my gap year lab. Um, I won an AV making a virus competition, which was really funny at the time. Um, but in, and I'll, tell, I'll talk a little bit more later about the different um, timelines people take to applying to programs. For me, that was the best choice. And I ended up spending um, two years, like really taking the MCAT and applying to programs during my gap years. And then here I am at my white coat ceremony. Um, Dr. Brass here is our MD PhD director. There are about 21 of us in the incoming class um, for the 2026 MD PhD uh, class at Penn. Um, so, uh, it's been quite a journey and I'm, I'm really happy to share what I've learned with you. I did want to add one caveat. Um, what, I'm, what I say is not rule of law. Take it with a grain of salt. Um, your experience may be different than mine. You may have different opinions and that's okay. Um, and, and what I'm saying is, is not like you have to do it my way or, you, or you'll get in. I'm just saying from my experience, this is the safest way, but there are other ways. Um, so as Alejandra mentioned, I'm interested in tackling emerging and re-emerging viral infections. Um, this is kind of ironic because we're in the middle of a pandemic and my clinical training was stopped and we were pulled out of lab. Um, and I'll talk a little later about what I did during this time. Um, but here are three viruses that I've worked with during my career so far. Um, there is yellow fever, dengue, and HIV. Um, and I did want to take a moment to highlight that uh, an important part of your application uh, to an MD-PhD program is thinking about uh, why you want to be a physician scientist, why you need an MD and a PhD in order to achieve your goals. Um, so really think about that and think about, um, you know, it, why you need both, because if not during the, the, the written application, then certainly during the interview, 
um, you, you might get really asked questions of like, well, do you really need this part of your training? Do you really need this part? And, and the idea is that you, you need both so that you're a better scientist and so that you're a better doctor and so that um, there, there's a synergy between both trainings. Um, to give you an example for me, I hope to be inspired by um, it, what I see in the, in the clinic um, in, in terms of the sort of therapies and diagnostics that I help develop um, for, for tackling emerging and re-emerging viral infections. Um, and, and I know that my, my research would also just be um, it completely um, pushed forward by the, by the people that I see that are struggling with these diseases and by the need for, for a cure and for um, a, a better preventative measure. Here's a little bit of an outline. I'll talk about the heart of an MD-PhD program, um, and I'll show you a slide that you'll probably recognize from Dr. Brass's presentation yesterday. Um, I'll talk a lot about research because really uh, a successful MD-PhD application has a very good presentation of the applicant's research experience and how they're ready for an MD-PhD. Talk about checking boxes, both in terms of stats and experiences, a little bit about the application timeline, different permutations, a snapshot of how the MD-PhD application may look a little different than the MD one on MCAS. Um, putting it all together, some resources for you guys, and then some pictures from my first years of MD-PhD tra training because, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So the heart of the MD-PhD program, uh, Dr. Brass showed this to you yesterday, um, is the same as the heart of an application, okay? So these gray parts are essentially it's essentially your MD training is going to be the same as your MD, as your MD classmates. Okay. And so that's why your willing, your preparedness for your, the PhD phase is really what going to set you apart from your MD, from, from an MD only applicant. And if you can really show the admissions directors that you are prepared for a PhD, that, that you want to use your MD education for your research, that there is synergy there, then that, that is really going to create a successful application. Okay, a little bit more about research. Uh, some programs require that you have a letter from every research experience you have. Um, if it's a big research experience where it's like one of the main ones you're going to talk about, you definitely want that letter to come from a PI if you can. Some of these letters, um, let's say it's your first research experience and you were like, what is a pipette? Then um, it may be possible for that letter to come primarily from a postdoc or a graduate student. And um, the, the PI may sign off on that letter or, or may not. Um, so it, it, they don't all have to come from a PI, but certainly your biggest ones that you're going to focus on in your application should come from a PI. Um, it's not just, it, it, so there are kind of like five main parameters that can help you um, really stand out in your application as an MD-PhD applicant. The first parameter is how you talk about your research. So it's not just what you did. If, if you sound really dry and you don't really understand what you did, that's like, that's worse than someone who didn't do a lot, but like understands what they did and why they did it and how it fits into the, the whole, um, you know, ether of, of scientific research in that field. So know how to talk about your research, know an elevator pitch, um, know how to talk about your research to an elementary school kid, to an expert in your field, to an expert in a different field. Uh, be able to talk about how your research fits into the field, um, what the hypothesis was, what your approach was, um, and why, why you approach it that way. Literally just like take ownership of that research experience and the way you talk about it. Um, and you should do this for every research experience you have on your application to a degree. And, this, and you should really shine in this regard for research that you're going to talk a lot about in your application. Uh, for me, for example, I, 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 I kind of stratify research into like really important research experiences and less important research experiences. Um, so I worked in one lab for four months and then I studied abroad and worked in another lab for three months. Those are my like minor research experiences. I spent a year and a half doing my undergraduate thesis research and two years doing my gap year research. Those are my major research experiences. Um, so number two, there are these objective measures of productivity and success like papers, abstracts, presentations, and posters. You should try to have some of these if you can. If COVID interrupted your ability of, to get some of these, you should write about that in your uh, application, like that you were planning on presenting at a conference where your abstract got 
accepted, but you weren't able to. You don't need a paper in order to get into an MD PhD program. If people try to tell you that, it's wrong. Okay, it's helpful. It certainly is, but it's not necessary, not at all. Um, prioritize and optimize your reach experiences. So, like, um, you can tell through the way you talk about um, a research experience and and what you did, so you could spend more time in the lab. Whether research was a priority for you, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So, as an undergrad. While I was doing my senior thesis research my last year and a half, I took three classes every semester uh, so that I could spend a lot of time in lab. I would go to lab before my 8 a.m. class. I would run gels during class. Like I pushed my research forward as much as I could. And then I talked about that in my application because I wanted people to know that like research is important to me. And I was able to juggle several things. But at the end of the day, I got my research done. Um, you're going to need to calculate the number of hours you spend in lab for AMCAS. Uh, so try to keep some sort of tally. You can count time that you spent preparing presentations about your research, time that you spent working on a publication, time that you spent writing about your thesis research. Um, while you were running a gel, if you were doing something else, you can still count that time. So it's like a little flexible, but just try to keep a tally of that. Lastly, try to have some independent aspects to your research. Now, it, this doesn't mean that you have to work without a postdoc or without a graduate student, but uh, present your research at lab meeting. Um, you know, take ownership of it, answer questions about it, uh, troubleshoot issues that come up in your experiment. Be part of every conversation, if you can, with your PI and your graduate student about your project. Talk about, you know, what the paper is going to look like and, and, and what your main goals are. Um, to have independent research experience, it, it doesn't mean that you're alone. It just means that you're taking ownership of it and you're driving it forward in any way that you can. Um, so it, it, it's really important to demonstrate that you have had independent research experience, that, that you've sought it in your application. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about stats because a lot of, I, I think this is like the Achilles heel for a lot of people, and it certainly was for me. Um, you know, people will tell you you need a 4.0 or like a ridiculously high MCAT, and that's not true. Okay, um, now you should try to do a, the best that you can, um, and then you'll probably fall short because it's just like what happens to humans, and that's okay. Um, you need to meet a minimum cutoff for uh, whatever the school has that you're applying to. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. So. Um, you can see down here, this blue section is uh, the, it, on Penn's MD PhD website. And this is their, they list that the average GPA is 3.9, that's pretty high, and that the average MCAT is 521 of accepted students. But then they list a range 3.55 and 512. I was closer to the lower end of the range than to the average. Okay. I was, I'm going to say that one more time, okay? I was closer to the lower end of the range than the average, and I interviewed at 15 MSTPs. So once you check the box, it's not going to make or break your application anymore. After that, everything else matters a lot more than your numbers. So meet the minimum requirement. And even if you don't meet the minimum requirement, like let's say you had a little lower than this and Penn is still your dream school, you can still consider applying, okay? I'll, I'll say that some other schools that I got into, um, I, my numbers were lower than their lowest range that they publicized. And so they were like lying or wrong or something because like I was lower than that and I still got in. So I, I, I'm just saying like, you don't need to be perfect. Definitely try your hardest um, and it's, it's worth a shot. Okay, experiences are kind of like checking boxes for stats. Uh, I'm just going to check the time. Okay. Um, this may be a little different than MD only applications where, um, you know, maybe you need a certain number of shadowing hours or volunteering hours in a clinical setting. Uh, although I've had classmates who were MD only applicants have a similar number of hours than I did in these two categories. I think the safest approach is to hit all four of these categories in some way. Okay. The safest approach is to shadow doctors and volunteer in a clinical setting and volunteer in a non-clinical setting and have leadership in extracurriculars. If you aren't able to do one of these, 
you know, I like, I'm not going to tell you not to apply. I'm saying this is the safest way, but I, I certainly know people who are missing some of these, excuse me, and still got in. Um, I will also say that shadowing doctors and volunteering in a clinical setting may be difficult because of COVID right now. Um, and we can talk about this a little later, but there are ways to uh, get experiences that will be useful for you um, that, that aren't in person. Um, and so, as I mentioned, these are my, these are my stats when it came to these hours. And, and, and I'll highlight one more time that like what matters is about how you present these experiences and the impact they had on you and not necessarily the hours. So take notes about these meaningful experiences um, as you shadow doctors, as you volunteer in a cl clinical setting, or if you volunteer remotely. And you're going to want to include vignettes in your MCAS application, in your personal statement, in your MDPHD essay, essay, in your activities list. Um, and if it's a patient, definitely change the name. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't HIPAA and all of that. You don't want to include the patient's name. If it's a doctor that you shadowed, you can include the doctor's name probably. Um, if it's a favorable interaction that you're presenting, um, and you're going to want to show and not tell with those stories. So definitely a kind of a keep a log of your story. Um, if it were me right now and I was not able to land an in-person shadowing experience with doctors or an in-person clinical volunteering experience, I would have um, volunteered at some sort of pandemic um, volunteer efforts and support people. And I would have supported people in my community remotely. Um, you know, in Philadelphia, for example, there's an opportunity for you to volunteer and call elderly individuals who are uh, in their homes and can't leave and no one can visit because of COVID. So there are ways of like learning about what it's like to be, uh, you know, vulnerable in, in a setting that is kind of similar to a patient setting without uh, an in-person volunteer experience. You could do something like that. If you're not able to shadow a doctor, for example, I would have reached out to um, individuals on this um, Twitter uh, list of individuals who are interested in mentoring, and I would have talked to physician scientists and asked them about their experience, about you know what it's like to transition between two worlds. I would have talked to MDs and asked them about you know what it's like to make difficult decisions with patients and about their experiences. And then I would have written about these experiences in my application. So I'm saying, um, you know, th these are difficult times and there are ways around this. Um, even if you can't get these exact experiences, there are probably ways of substituting for them and still kind of demonstrating that you understand what it's like to be a doctor and demonstrating that you understand um, you have a vision for what kind of doctor you're going to be. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of permutations um, as to what well, I might have to move this. Oh. Okay. Um, there, are, there are definitely a lot of ways uh, of approaching the, the application process. This is mine, uh, and I'll show you a couple of others, but I'm, I'm not exhaustive. Okay. Um, okay. The most important thing for an MDPH. TH, PhD application is to start research as soon as you can and continue it until you apply. Okay, it's the heart of the application. I, I can't stress that enough. Start extracurriculars as soon as you can and then do them because you love them and because they demonstrate, no, actually just do them because you love them. Like don't do things you don't enjoy because it shows. Um, and then use them to demonstrate qualities about yourself. Like I literally showed salsa dancing I, I, I use salsa dancing on my uh, activity li activities list to demonstrate something that like I was really bad at, but embodied my culture and I just worked really hard to, to become good at it. So literally you can spin anything. Um, and then start clinical shadowing and volunteering in the years leading up to your application. So I did this during my gap years. Um, it, Princeton doesn't have a med school, so it was like hard to do this on campus and you kind of had to travel. So that was one of the reasons I took a gap year. Um, you want to take your MCAT by the spring of your application year, if you're able to. Um, I took mine on March 31st of 2017. Um, and if you take it in, if, if you take it earlier in the spring, then you can have your 
MCAT score by May as you're preparing your application. And you can know kind of which schools are going to be more open to you based on your score and whether you want to retake it. So uh, I would definitely recommend taking it during that time. And um, I'll make a note. There are some, like, you have to take the MCAT within, like, two years of matriculating or something. So there, you can't take it too early. Um, and then there are some months when it's not offered. Like, for my year, it was, like, January to March. So just really be careful that you look this up years before you apply and you know kind of when you want to be taking it. And then I spent my whole second gap year um, doing writing primary applications, secondary apps, and interviewing. Um, so you can see, like... I started studying for my gap year for the MCAT the year I graduated in 2016. I took it in 2017. And then I um, did primary, secondaries, and interviews 2017 to 2018. And then I matriculated to Penn MD PhD in 2018. This took two years. Okay. And before that, I was doing research, extracurriculars. Um, and then, you know, I also did clinical shadowing and volunteering. Like this takes a lot of planning. So if, if, you're applying to MDs or MD PhD programs in the next few years, draw out a timeline and, um, you know, see what works for you. Okay. So what happens if you take one gap year? Well, you do uh, research as early as you can and extracurriculars. You have to do clinical shadowing and volunteering at, while you're an undergrad, you have to balance that. And then you have to take the MCAT um, ideally by the spring of your senior year. Um, some people took it in the summer, but then they kind of, we're not in the first wave of applicants. Um, and then you apply during your gap year. Um, this is really difficult to do, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're applying to a new lab, uh, because um, labs know that if you are only taking one gap year, you're going to be like interviewing and doing a lot of stuff during it, and, and they're not going to get a lot out of you. So I, I know people who were really qualified and they, they got rejected by like 20 labs before they found a lab that would accept them for one gap year. This is very hard to do if you're going to um, a new lab. Now, if you're staying with a lab where you did research as an undergrad, it's going to be maybe easier um, to stay on. And, and this is more feasible. So just know that there is that kind of roadblock that you're going to face. Um, the reason why I didn't do this uh, was because I knew that it was, it was going to be easier to find a lab of my choosing if I did two gap years. And I also didn't want to do clinical shadowing and volunteering as an undergrad. And I did not want to mess with taking the MCAT as an undergrad because I didn't really have faith in my test taking skills and it was a stressful prospect for me. So that's why I took two gap years. Oh, I'm not going to go back. Okay. What happens if you take no gap years? So you start research as early as you can. If you're not taking gap years, this ideally doesn't really happen. Like it happens at sophomore year or before. Otherwise, you don't really have a lot of research to write about, and you're not going to look as prepared for a PhD. Extracurriculars, clinical shadowing early on, your MCAT by the spring of junior year, your MCAS, primary and secondary year apps, and interviews senior year. Okay, we can go back to these if you guys are confused or have any questions. And um, know that, that people, um, they, they still will apply with like taking the MCAT late and just be kind of like a, a later application. And, and that's okay too. Okay. As I mentioned, there are permutations. Uh, this is just kind of the safest way to play it. Okay. Um, the MD PhD primary app is the same as the MD MCAT, except you have a couple of additional items. You have an MD PhD essay. It's like why, you know, why you want both degrees, um, a research experience hours, and then a significant research experience essay, which is about a thousand words, I think. Um, and you have to balance information between these and uh, your personal statement, which you also write. Um, I can talk more about this later if you guys have questions. Uh, my, my mentor told me that she recommended not writing about research in the personal statement and writing about other things because you're going to write about research in the MD PhD essay and the significant research experience essay. But you guys do what you want to do. Okay. Uh, and then at the end, it's about your cohesive application and not just one part. So it's, um, it's how you write it. You know, it looks, needs to look polished. There, there can't be like tons of grammatical errors, cohesive. You're telling stories. You're showing your qualities. You're not telling someone like, 
you know, I'm, I'm honest and I'm loyal and I advocate for people like literally tell stories that show these in your essays. And that, that is going to have a much bigger impact in, in, in the admissions committee remembering your application than you just like throwing words at them that they're, they're not going to believe it if they don't see it. If that makes sense. You need to balance your information across your application. So your MD PhD essay, your research experience essay, your personal statement, your activities list. And then in your secondary applications, you should have kind of some news stories to tell um, because, you know, they, you shouldn't really be repeating stories verbatim. I mean, you can expand upon them, but they should, you should, I don't know, you, you need to be interesting. I know it's like a lot to ask. This is like terrifying. Um, spend a lot of time on your application, start your personal statement and your other essays as early as you can. For me, remember I took the MCAT in 2017, March, 2017. And so I started, uh, I first started my personal statement in like January of 2017. So I really took like six months to write it. Um, and for your clinical volunteering and shadowing, it's really not about the hours. It's about the experiences and the impression they had on you and how they informed your desire and your understanding of being a doctor. Here are some resources for future applicants. Um, and Alejandra uh, told me that she's going to be putting some in the chat box. Um, so I am the chair of the diversity committee for the American Physician Scientist Association, so APSA. And individuals in my committee have been putting on these amazing sessions to support MD and DO PhD applicants for this cycle. And I think they're going to be continuing it for future ones. There's an upcoming one on um, the 27th of August on interviews during this year, uh, which are going to be mostly virtual. So if you're planning on interviewing um, in the coming years, I would, for an, a combined degree or really just even MD, I would highly recommend attending this session. Um, I would follow apps on Twitter because that's where we really blast a lot of these things. Um, there's also free mentorship and research opportunities through APSA, and so you can go to this website. Um, this is an FAQ document that we created, and Dr. Brass is one of the authors for it, as are three other MD-PhD directors. It's just a list of questions that they answered and then just a bunch of resources. If you're planning on applying to MD-PhD programs at some point, I would highly recommend that you go here. On Twitter, there's a list of uh, people who have said they're, they, they are open to mentor and support applicants to MD-PhD programs. They're either physician scientists themselves or current trainees. And so I would highly reach out to people on this list uh, if you need to talk to someone about this journey. Um, and here are some papers. All of these are already on the, um, this link, the APSA FAQ document. Okay, last slide. Um, almost last slide before I open the floor to questions. Um, so what have I done so far, right? Um, I am a third year in the program, which means I've done uh, my year and a half of preclinicals because at Penn we do a year and a half instead of two. I took some grad school courses. That was the MVPHC part. I did uh, research in the summer between my first and second year. Um, I did three months of my clinical rotations. I did my internal medicine rotation. I took step one like a week ago and I'm here. We're not talking about that because I didn't know how I did. Um, and I just started grad school, like orientation is this week. So I'm going to do a year of grad courses, figure out what lab I'm going to go into. Then I'm just going to like pop out a dissertation. Um, and then I'm going to go back into lab and er, go back into uh, clerkships, finish them, do some electives. And then I'll probably do a residency. But people have, you know, they have different different strokes for different folks. Some people just do a postdoc and drop um, the clinical practice. Okay, just to prove to you that like the MD PhD track, um, especially in the first two years, looks a lot like an MD track, but also like you're just a normal person. I have some pictures during my first two years of my MD PhD. Here's our white coat ceremony with my MD PhD class. Um, my first the fall of my first year of med school, I got a ganglion cyst removed from my dominant hand. That was like, it was really hard to anatomy with like a hand that wasn't working. I went to a lot of concerts. This is a Maroon 5 concert, highly recommend. Um, at a white elephant gift exchange with my MD PhD class, I won like 12 avocados. I will admit some of them went bad. Um, 
I watched The Bachelor with my MD PhD class. I went to a dance with uh, my, you know, all the med school, and this is my MD PhD class at the dance. We're cute. I went to the Dominican Republic um, to talk to hospital leaders about um, a dengue research collaboration, and that's an ongoing project which I'm really excited about. I went to Cuba with some MD classmates during my first year of spring break, and I learned about the healthcare system. Also, drank rum. Was great. Uh, I got engaged uh, with my fiancés in the background. Um, this spring, I did my internal medicine rotation. Very sleep deprived. Also, very happy to be part of a team and like taking care of patients. And then the pandemic hit. And so then I co-started an organization um, that gives smart phones and like smart devices to people who need to communicate um, during the pandemic, which includes like patients and elderly individuals that are dying alone, but also now kids who need to connect to their studies. Okay, so here's just like some things you can ask me about. Um, and this is the last slide. Um, so you can ask me about any of these things. I'm not going to read them out to you because I bet you have your own questions. Uh, my interest in extracurriculars are like in ID, virology, and immunology, but I can talk about my other friends that are doing other things. I care a lot about mentorship. I care a lot about diversity. I love global experiences and research. And I also, I do extracurriculars. I'm also into cold brew. I make my own cold brew now. And I carry around mason jars. This is what happens when you live in West Philly. So that's the end of my presentation. And I welcome questions. All right. Thank you so much, Gently. Your presentation was amazing. I don't know how you explained all of that so in like such a short amount of time. But <laughs> thank you so much. And congrats on getting engaged. That's so exciting. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Um, we have a lot of questions from the audience. So I'll start with the ones that have the most votes. So um, how do you choose which PhD area interests you once you get accepted? Are you required to do the same area of research as your undergrads um, experiences? That's a really good question. Um, I would say you are not required. Um, and it helps if you demonstrate that you've done research in a couple of different areas that you can like go in, go in between. But I would say the most important thing is to demonstrate that you can become very good at a research field and that you can transition that into any research field and just like have a story for, especially if during an interview, you're gonna be like, I've done research on HIV, but what I really wanna do is study um, gut epithelia. Okay, just like have a reason why that interests you. So it turns out that like weird things happen to like CD4 cells in HIV infected patients in their gut. So like you can have a story, just like have one so it doesn't sound too random. I'll say one more thing. Um, at Penn at least, um, and I think this is the case for a lot of programs, you apply into one particular pro program, but once you're in, you can do a lot of things. Um, so you can like transition into another graduate department entirely. Um, once you once you're in there's more flexibility uh and as to how i knew um that i wanted to do this so i was lucky to have several research opportunities um and i did research on bacteriology and then i did research on um like a protein just like straight up biochemistry and I was doing the biochem research during the Ebola outbreak. And that's where I was like, you know, like emerging viruses impact a lot of underserved communities globally. And there needs to be more research. Um, and that that is something that kind of aligns with my advocacy and um, microbiology interests. I will also say, um, Alejandra, you as, you know, someone that I've mentored, like you, you've also... I mean, like you, you kind of know, like, yes, this research I like, or no, this research I don't like. And you have the onus to, to try to get another experience. Now, if, if you can't get another experience, I would say it's better to stay in one you don't like until you can get another experience. Um, but if you don't like it, just be true to yourself and try to find another one. And, um, 
and highlight your strengths and highlight the fact that now you have some research experience and you can apply that to another field. I hope that was helpful. Yes, it was really helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, this question is kind of like, why did you choose to do MD-PhD and why did you choose uh, PENS MSTP? So it's a personal question. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I don't mind. Um, oh, why MD-PhD? This sounds like my interviews all over again. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I realized that I wanted my work to be translational and I wanted it to um, to be patient oriented. And the research that I was drawn to in the lab was that that had more applications to humans. Um, and that was what really like got me up in the morning and got me really interested in research. Um, so I realized that I wanted my research to be translational. Um, and I realized that being able to see the patients that had the diseases that I was interested in studying would allow me not only to have access to patient samples, but would help me kind of understand um, the, the disease process a little better and understand what the therapeutic or the preventative measure really needed to look like in order to have a maximum impact. Um, and then I'll say that as, as someone who has had lab rotations in my MD-PhD program and has had clinical experience with having done my internal medicine rotation, like. I love both, right? I just, I love the research and I love taking care of patients. And so if one day I had to just do one, like I would do it. I mean, I, I prefer to do both, but like, I love both and I, I don't want to choose one over the other if I don't have to. Um, why Penn MS MSTP? Um, so I was lucky that I had some pretty fantastic options. Um, and so in the end, I was choosing between Hopkins, Columbia, Duke, UCSF, and Penn. And I chose Penn because um, you, can, you can tell that the program is more than the sum of its parts. It's more than the great research that happens at Penn, and it's more than the great medicine that happens at Penn. It's a program that has uh, decades of institutional knowledge and knows how to turn out physician scientists um, if there's any like bump in the road that has happened to a trainee, it's happened at Penn and the administration has institutional knowledge to help people overcome those. Um, the, I also like really enjoyed the research options I had at Penn. You should, you should definitely choose a place that has multiple PIs you would want to work with. Don't just go for one, like, like the research environment. And lastly, I could see myself living in Philadelphia. And I know that that's not something that's really important for, for everyone to be able to envision yourself somewhere. Um, but I just felt that with the cost of living and with, with the, the sort of city and the fact that there were green areas and all of that, like I, I would be able to, to still be a happy person and be an MD PhD trainee. And I've definitely found that to be true. I mean, I've gone to like a lot of concerts and, um, tasted a lot of amazing food and, and been able to do touristy stuff and also live in a place that, that feels like home. And um, that whole combination was important to me. Awesome, great response. Now let's do next question. Um, I just decided during this pandemic to pursue an MD PhD program, but I haven't done any research yet. I just finished my sophomore year of college. Can I still apply? And kind of connected to that question, uh, how many years slash hours of research would you recommend uh, for someone who plans to apply to an MD PhD program? Okay, um, yeah, that, so they're definitely connected. Um, yes, so I, as you can see with my timeline, um, there are many ways of approaching this career path. The, did you finish? Okay, so you just finished your sophomore year of college. I would say it would be difficult for you to apply without taking gap years, but not impossible. If you found the right mentor and you were able to get like some independence in your research experience and able to get enough of it that you felt like you were ready for a PhD. And remember, like, if you're already there, then it's like, 
the research you do during your application year is just bonus. But if you haven't reached that level of independence, then your application is going to fall flat in the way it looks because you're not going to come across as someone who's ready for a PhD. Um, so it's definitely possible without taking gap years. Um, if, if you get like a research experience now and the right mentorship, um, it's going to be easier to do if you take gap years. Um, and but I will say that like going to the second question, like a lot of programs are seeing the trend of people taking gap years and program directors, like they don't think it's necessary. Like your application looks different if you took two gap years versus you went straight through. That's completely true. I had um, almost 7,000 hours of research experience, but someone who goes straight through from undergrad is not going to have that. So they're not going to be expected to have that. I don't know what the number is for someone who goes straight through, but I know it's lower. Um, I, I would say um, for the person who asked question number one, if you, if a year from now you feel like you have found the right research mentor, um, done enough research that's like independent and good quality, and you feel like you're ready for a PhD, then I would say apply straight through. If you feel like you need more experience, then I would say take one gap year or two based on what is necessary. But I have no doubt that you could put your ducks in a row given time and achieve your dream. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, our next question is interesting. It says, for dancing, did you have to join a group and do performances to put on your application or was it more something you did like personally with friends? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it was something I did with friends. You don't, you should try to find 15 activities if you can to put in your activities list. Your research activities can each be one individual one. If you have some small research activities, you might be able to put two into one. Um, and a hobby like underwater basket weaving can be one activity, even if it's not competitive. Okay, so salsa dancing for me, I learned how to do it while studying abroad in England, which is strange that I had to literally cross the sea from my Puerto Rican family to learn how to dance. And I just like did a lot of dancing and then I learned and then I took some classes when I came back to Princeton and then I just, it's something that I enjoyed doing. Um, I didn't have tons of hours in it, but it's something that I was passionate about and that came across in my application and that's what matters. I also lived in a house with like 20 other people in Boston. Um, it was a co-op, a Quaker co-op. It was like really awesome and weird at the same time. So I wrote about that and I was like on a committee for that co-op. And so that was an extracurricular. So what I'm saying is like your extracurriculars don't have to be competitive. Think outside the box, but they add a dimension to you that comes across in your application and that you can talk about during interviews. And so you actually sound like a real person and uh, not just a well put together application. And they like that. Great. That's awesome. And I like that you mentioned like how they actually want to see that you're a person like it's not just filling out these boxes like just be who you are and you'll be fine. Exactly. exactly. Um, let's see. I heard that your pre-med classes expire after some time once you graduate. Since you took some gap years, did you have any of these issues? And also if did you if you had issues with the MCAT related to like it expiring or something like that? Um, so I've heard of the MCAT expiring. Like I said, when I applied, I thought it was two years after you take it, you need to matriculate. Um, I've not heard issues of pre-med classes expiring. I took a biostats course through the Harvard Extension School. Um, it was, I mean, it wasn't competitive to get it at all. It was just like you just sign up for it. I think it was helpful for me to take one class during my gap year to show that like I'm continuing my education, but I think I still would have gotten in if I hadn't done that. I just hadn't taken a stats course at Princeton. So it may have been necessary for my application. Um, I would say if you graduate with a degree in molecular biology and then become an architect for 10 years and then apply to MD PhD programs, what 
or MD programs, then your preclinical classes may have expired. Even if you had a 4.0, it's like, that's a decade ago, okay? Um, if, if it's just a couple of years, even if it's two, three, or four, I, it's my hunch that it wouldn't have expired, but I would reach out to some people on that um, Twitter mentor thing and ask other people's opinions, or you know, go to one of these APSA sessions and ask MD, PhD directors about what they think, um, whether they view courses as, as having expired. I, and I see that there's a question on downside to a gap year, which is kind of similar um, to, to this question. Uh, I have white hairs, okay. Like I'm getting older, I guess. Um, I'm 27, I think. And cause I took one gap year between high school and college. So yeah, you're older, that sucks. But at the same time, it was so nice to live in the real world before starting school again. Um, and I don't think I would have been here if I had been in what is a really stressful and sometimes toxic pre-med environment in college where like advisors are telling you, you need to do this or you won't get in. And like your classmates are like, what is your grade? And you know, like it can be stressful and it doesn't have to be like that. For me, gap years, were the right choice for many reasons, but I recognize that the downside is that I'm older. All right, thank you so much for your response. <laughs> um, I like this next question. Um, is it possible to do a PhD in a non-science discipline such as psychology? And yeah, I think that's the question. So non-science. Yes, it totally is. Um, and there are only Mm, there are only some programs that have funding for that. Um, Penn is one. Uh, UCSF with UC Berkeley has some. Yale has some. It, there just like aren't tons. And so if you're doing a non-trad MD, PhD, like in the social sciences or, or economics or something like that, uh, you're just not going to have that many spots that you're applying for, but it's totally possible. And Dr. Brass is a big proponent of um, chimeras that come from many different uh, backgrounds. If this is you, um, you can reach out to me through Alejandra and I can put you in touch with someone who's doing a social sciences MD, PhD at Penn. Okay. Awesome. Yes. And everyone has my um, email. Uh, if you go to the website, you can find my email. So if you do need to contact, contact Yentley, you can um, email me and I'll give you her contact. Um, let me see. How do you suggest getting chances to shadow physician scientists and seeing what they do? To my experience, it is easier to find a way to shadow a physician and do research with a scientist but much harder to find physician scientists to shadow. So I guess it's just how to find um, physician scientists to shadow. Oh yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, maybe I was really vague about this in my presentation, I apologize. I shadowed physicians. I don't think I shadowed physician scientists. I did not have a physician scientist mentor when applying. Um, I think it's completely fine to not have one. It's nice to talk to, to one like, like that, you know, Twitter list, it's nice to talk to one about like what they do with their careers. And I think at my work, I set up a meeting to talk to a couple and just ask them about their experiences. But I shadowed MDs and I did research with straight PhD PIs. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and I think we have uh, some time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, let me see in the chat, there's something here. Mm. Sorry, give me one second. Uh, I guess I'll just do this one here. Um, how do you suggest finding labs to work in during gap years? Is it more um, favorable to find something in the field you think you're going to do your PhD in? Yeah. Um, so I would suggest applying as a lab technician and then you'll get paid and it's a job, which is nice. And 
in your interviews, ask about whether there's an opportunity for some independent research because you want to grow as a scientist. Um, I think there are pros and cons of, like, I think it's going to be maybe easier to get into a lab where you are bringing experiences that are relevant to them so they don't have to retrain you and everything. Um, but if you really want to transition to another field or you want to explore another field, that's completely valid too. Uh, you should maybe just apply to some different labs so that you have a chance of getting into one. And, and it's not just because you're applying to a different field that you're not able to get a research experience. Definitely apply early. Um, so as a senior in college, I was applying to labs in like January and February. And in, if you're doing um, lab, like wet lab work, it's going to be easier to get a research experience position than a lot of other fields because there are, there's like always a need for a technician. Okay. I'll say one more thing. If your PI is willing to make a call to the other PI of the lab you're applying to and vouch for you, you might just be a shoe in. If PIs are nice and do that, then like, um, yeah, that's really nice. Okay, awesome. Let me see if we can find another question. Um, any advice staying curious as a researcher when working at home? So in context of the current pandemic, I guess, um, if you're doing research remotely, like any advice of things that they can, could do? Yeah. Um, if you can, so I would say the pan, the, the world of virtual research kind of opens up time for you to do things like learning a skill that you didn't have before and you didn't have time for, like maybe learn how to analyze RNA-seq data and code in R. Like that's a really useful skill probably um, with this new era of everything being, you know, single cell. Um, that's something that I did. I took a class in that. Um, you can also try to write a paper with API, just like a lit review or something like that, try to contribute to the body of knowledge that's in the field. Um, and like there are ways to sign up for like getting weekly um, papers in your inbox uh, so that you don't have to keep like searching on PubMed. And so you can sign up for topics that really interest you and, and then you know, read a couple papers a week or a day or whatever floats your boat. So there are certainly ways of staying engaged, uh, but it's been difficult. Um, and your question is a really valid one. The, the pandemic has been hitting a lot of people hard when it comes to mental, emotional, and physical health for many reasons. Um, and this is a very difficult time to be applying. Um, and my heart goes out to you guys. And, and that's why organizations like APSA are creating these resources to try to support applicants so that we have uh, the, the next generations of physician scientists trainees are diverse um, and and are they, they feel supported because we're, we're here for you guys. All right. Thank you so much Anthony, for your amazing presentation and like all of our students were super interested and had amazing questions and I really appreciate you um, as my mentor participating in this event. So thank you so much for all your guidance. Of course, Alejandra, thank you so much.